Today's episode of STEM in 30 is all about the International Space Station. Specifically, 15 years of human presence on the space station. To kick things off, we have 15 facts about the International Space Station, brought to you by our friends here at the National Air and Space Museum. Fact number 15. The International Space Station completes 15 and a half orbits per day and an orbit every 90 minutes. This means that they see 16 sunrises and sunsets every day. Fact number 14. Two members of the crew, Scott Kelly and Mikhail Kornienko, are in the middle of spending an entire year in space. Number 13. The International Space Station is visible from your backyard if you know where to look. 12. The ISS is almost the size of a football field. Number 11. The solar panels on the International Space Station provide over 75 kilowatts of power, are over eight acres in size, and connected by eight miles of wire. Number 10. The International Space Station orbits approximately 250 miles above the Earth. Number nine. There are two toilets on the International Space Station. Astronauts have to strap themselves in to use them. Number eight. Some of the modules of the International Space Station are called Zvezda, Unity, Zarya, Destiny, and Harmony. The Russian modules, Zvezda and Zarya, mean star and sunrise, respectively. Number seven. There are 52 computers on the ISS. Number six. 26 countries participate in the operation of the International Space Station. Number five. The ISS weighs over 450 tons. That's almost one million pounds. Number four. 220 different people have visited the International Space Station, including astronauts from 17 countries, 33 women, seven tourists, 79 double, 28 triple, and six quadruple flyers. Number three. The International Space Station has been continuously occupied since November of 2000. That means for the last 15 years, there has not been a single day without an astronaut in orbit around the Earth. Number two. Equipment on board the International Space Station has included an espresso machine, a 3D printer, and a treadmill named after Stephen Colbert. And the number one fun fact about 15 years on the International Space Station. The International Space Station travels at a minimum speed of 17,500 miles an hour. That's what we call smoking. I have another fun fact for you. 15 times 2 is... Oh, I see where you're going with this. This wait, wait, is... wait, 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 wait. We have some friends who are astronauts who have actually been on the International Space Station. Why don't we let them introduce? Samantha Cristoforetti. Reed Wiseman. I'm Randy Bresnik. Paolo Nespoli. Terry Verts. Clayton Anderson. This is 730. Hi, I'm Marty. And I'm Beth. We are coming to you live today from the National Air and Space Museum in Washington, D.C., from the Moving Beyond Earth Gallery. And as you saw, our show today is about the International Space Station. But the International Space Station is not the first station in space. The International Space Station is not the human race's first space station. The idea of a space station has been around for 150 years. An American novelist wrote a story about a giant brick moon up in the heavens. Later, physicist Herman Oberth coined the term space station. Sixty-five years ago, Dr. Werner von Braun published an article about a space station that could serve as a jumping-off place to Mars. Not long after that, the Soviets and the United States had a 15-year race to the moon. After the U.S. landed on the moon, the Soviets refocused their efforts into creating a low-Earth orbit space station. Salyut 1 orbited the Earth for six months before it was de-orbited. Skylab was launched by the United States, becoming America's first space station. Astronauts were able to spend a total of 84 days on board. With the Apollo-Soyuz test project, the United States and the Soviets worked together for the first time. 
Two spaceships were launched, from the U.S. and from the USSR, and these two spaceships docked in space. After launching six more Salyut missions, the Soviets began construction of the space station Mir, which stayed in orbit for 15 years. At the time, Mir shattered all the long-duration spaceflight records. Mir also showed cooperation between the former Soviets, now Russia, the United States, and countries throughout the world. The Mir was the first truly modular space station, and its design was a stepping stone towards our current International Space Station. Well, let's start by welcoming our audience. Today, moving beyond Earth, we have Potomac Prep with us, and also online, Christ the King in Rutland, Vermont. They'll have a couple of questions for us later in the broadcast. We'd also like to thank all of our online viewers and those watching on NASA TV today, and remind you that you can submit questions. We have an expert standing by ready to answer those questions, and some of them we will actually use on the show today. Today, we are celebrating 15 years of continuing human presence on the International Space Station. To get us started, let's go over to Samantha Cristoforetti, who spent 200 days on board the International Space Station. The International Space Station, what I like to call humanity's outpost in space, has been permanently inhabited since November 2000. So, happy 15th anniversary, International Space Station. So, earlier we asked some students, uh, what words describe the International Space Station? Uh, 450 students applied, we got over 1,500 words, and we made a word cloud. Now, a word cloud takes the words that were most used and makes them the largest on the screen. So, as you guys can see, space is the largest on the screen, right? Yeah. What are some other words that you think should be up there? I think you had a really good idea, didn't you? What, what, what's the word you wanted to put up there and why? The word I wanted to put up there was wonderful because the universe is really big and it seems like it should be, a, it, it seems like it's wonderful. Okay, so, so wonderful would be a word that you would add. Let's see what Kathy and Marty might add to our word cloud. All right, well, I'm joined today by Kathy Lewis, the curator for the International Space Programs here at the National Air and Space Museum. Kathy, you've seen that word cloud. Is there anything that you think is missing from there? There's one word that's not there. It's falling. Falling. Yes, because the astronauts are in fact falling as they orbit the Earth. They're traveling at 17 and a half thousand miles an hour, but they're really falling down towards Earth. So they just keep missing it, and that's how they go around. Awesome. Well, today we're talking about the International Space Station, and it really is an international collaboration. Yes, it is. It is a collaboration between the United States, Japan, the Russia, of course, the European Space Agency, and Canada. So there are 15 member states that are participating in it. Awesome. Now, some of the research going on right now involves a couple of the crew members, and it's kind of a little bit different than what we've done up there before. Yes, they're doing a, a really new experiment. They have a one-year in space program jointly between the United States and the Russians, and they're working with the Europeans as well. But they have an American cos astronaut, Scott Kelly, and a Russian cosmonaut, Mikhail Korinenko, and they are both going to stay on space in, for a year. Now, Scott Kelly, there's something really interesting about him, too. Yes, they have, this is an add-on for this. Scott Kelly, as you might know, is a twin. He has a twin, Mark Kelly, and Mark is staying here on the ground, and they're both being tested, and they're going to be able to have a control for the first time ever. They've got a twin, so when they know they started out the same, so we'll find out if they, they change in That's any awesome. way. So one of the things that happens to astronauts in space is a fluid shift, and sometimes we call that puffy head bird legs. Can you tell us about that? Well, it's something we don't think about a lot here on Earth. We're here on Earth. All of our fluids are being constantly pulled down, and so if you get an injury or you sit for a long time, you'll notice that your legs will start to swell, and you use those muscles, your calf muscles, your leg muscles, to pump the fluids back up. Well, the astronauts don't have the gravity pulling the, that fluid down, so the fluids stays pretty close around in their chest and in their faces because they don't have any gravity. So they get sort of congested. So when we see the images of the astronauts in space, their heads do look significantly bigger than they do here on Earth. Yes, it's sort of like having a, a cold, a, a head cold for a while. Wow. Now, 
astronauts and cosmonauts aren't the only ones that have been to the space station. There have also been a few tourists as well, right? Yes, there are tourists that go. They don't like to be called tourists. They like to be called self-financed space travelers. And we have here in the museum on exhibit the spacesuit, the Dennis Tito, who was the first self-financed um, space traveler, war in space. And in fact, there have been many who have done that. They paid the money. They've done training for six months. And there was one, Charles Simone, who used to work for Microsoft, who went up not once, but twice. He paid twice to go wow. to the space station. Were well, you ready to take some questions? Yes, absolutely. All right. Well, our first question is from Sophia from Christ the King School in Rutland, Vermont. Let's see what they've got to say. How do astronauts prepare for the long stay on the International Space Station? Really good question. The astronauts prepare by getting in the best physical shape possible. They also rehearse what they're going to be doing in the neutral buoyancy lab under the underwater tank and doing spacewalks. They also practice all the working on all the equipment they're going to be working on. And after years and years of being specialists as scientists and engineers and pilots, they also have to learn to be generalists. They have to be plumbers and cooks and electricians so they can maintain the space station and maintain it, keep it operating at full function. Awesome. All right, we've got an online question next. What is the most asked for food on the space station? Well, that is a, a difficult answer. Um, to, to come about because each person has a different idea of what they want to eat. What I heard is that the astronauts prefer spicy foods just because of, with that puffy face, they're congested, they lose their sense of smell, so they want to have something that's very spicy and tasty, but they also long for something from their childhood, something they remember that reminds them of home. Astronaut Sunita Williams had um, Slovenian sausages brought up for her. Uh, she grew up in Cleveland in the Slo Slovenian community, and that was something that reminded her of home. So she wanted to have those on the space station. Awesome. We've got an audience question. Hi, my name is Michaela, and my question is, does time move faster or slower in space? Does time move faster or slower in space? She must be really smart. I think she knows physics. Yes, time moves. Uh, Scott Kelly will be experiencing time slightly slower, more slowly than his brother Mark. So there, if there was any time difference between when they were born, he will actually gain on his brother um, and be a little bit younger. Not a whole lot, not a year, not money, not minutes, but milliseconds difference. Awesome. Well, one of the things that's really important to astronauts are the patches that they wear on their sleeve that represent their mission. Yeah, that's true. I understand that you had a chance to talk to astronaut Randy Bresnik, and maybe we can have him talk, tell us about patches on the space station. Sounds good. So I've got your mission patch here. Can you tell us a little bit about the, uh, the work that goes into this and some of the symbolism that's there? Uh, the neat part about mission patches is they, they try and capture the uh, essence or the, you know, the personality of the crew. And so our particular mission patch, you know, we had six uh, Americans uh, on the crew, which, which was unusual actually at the time because we had so many national partners who were flying on our space shuttle flights. And so the astronaut symbol, as you see the, the three uh, rays up to going up to the star with the little halo around it, that astronaut symbol typically is always gold. But for ours, being an all-American crew, we put the, the red, white, and blue as the, uh, the aspects of the, of the uh, astronaut symbol. Another neat part about uh, our patches, we uh, have little stars in the background above the Earth. And so the, the plan was to have a star for each one of the kids, you know, for representing all the kids that were in the families of our crew. And so we started out with 12, um, but about four months into it, as the patch was getting finalized, uh, we found out my wife was pregnant. And so we ended up putting a, a 13th uh, star on it. And then, uh, of course, the, the story goes that my wife ended up giving birth halfway through our mission down here on Earth while I was out doing spacewalks in space. And so uh, there's only a second, second time that's ever happened. That's pretty cool. Well, thank you so much for sharing that with us. Now, Kathy, you were telling me yesterday about a couple of mission patches that have symbolism not only within the patch, but across two patches. Well, it's a really interesting international story. The commander of the Soyuz mission that took, that it took Mark, uh, Scott Kelly up to the space station grew up in Russia, and he remembers witnessing the final mission to Apollo. So he designed his patch to sort of match and mimic the symbolism from the Apollo mission. So you can see they look very similar. They substituted some pictures and images for others. 
but it's a really nice crossover. That's really cool. Now, we have something we want you guys to do and all of our online viewers to do. We want to see your mission patches. We want you to go back to your classroom. We want you to, des to design a mission patch either for your class or a small group or even your family and think about all of that symbolism. And then we want to see pictures of your patches. You can have a parent or a teacher help you tweet them to STEMIN30 or put them on our Facebook page or you can email them to us at STEMIN30 at si.edu. Now, one of the really exciting things for me is you guys can actually go outside tonight, look up in the sky from your backyard, and see the International Space Station pass over. Have you ever done this before? Yes, I have. It's incredibly cool. I always wave. I don't know if they can see me or not. I don't think so. <laughs> but it is really cool. So here is how you can go out into your backyard and see the International Space Station. We can spot the International Space Station from our backyard, and all that we need to know is when and where to look. Let's start by going to the NASA website, spotthestation.nasa.gov. This will give us all the information we need. Now, let's try to spot the station. We see on this pass the station will become visible at north, northwest, at 8.32 p.m. Let's be sure we are on time because the space station won't wait. First, let's use our compass to find west. Now find north. Northwest is between north and west. North-northwest is between northwest and north. Okay, got it. Next, we see it's going to disappear in the east. Got that location. The entire visible pass will happen between those two areas. Now we have to determine how high it's going to be. Height is measured in degrees. There's a simple way to determine this height. Hold your hand out away from your body and make a fist. If you place the bottom of your fist on the horizon, that line where the sky meets the ground, the top of your fist will be approximately 10 degrees. You can then stack your fists on top of each other to reach 20, 30, 40 degrees or higher. Tonight, the space station will appear at 10 degrees north-northwest. If I place one fist in front of me while looking north-northwest, this is where it should first become visible. Got it. It will disappear at 20 degrees east. Right there. At its highest point, it will reach 40 degrees. Bingo. We now have a good idea of the approximate path that the space station will be traveling along. It's almost time. Let's look in the general direction of where the pass will become visible. We will scan a wider area in case we are a little off with our measurements. The station does not have lights outside that are visible from Earth. When we see it, we are actually seeing the sun reflecting off of it. Once the station becomes visible, it will take about six minutes to pass across the sky. It will not blink like an airplane. It will look like a very bright star that is traveling very fast across the sky. Here it comes. Wave to the astronauts. Kathy, we've talked a lot about the International Space Station today, but it seems like maybe we need to talk to somebody that's actually been to the International Space Station. Yeah, I understand you had a chance to talk with astronaut Clay Anderson. So let's get it from someone who's been on the space station for five months. I'm joined by astronaut Clay Anderson. Thank you so much for talking to us. You're a veteran of two space shuttle flights and you've spent over five months in space. Tell me a little bit about what's it like on the International Space Station? Living on the space station is a blast. I was Superman every day. I flew to breakfast, I flew to work. If I wanted to take a break and I flew to the bathroom, I even flew when I was going to the bathroom. It was awesome. What was your favorite thing on the space station? I think for most astronauts, or at least for me, the favorite thing to do was float around in zero G, right? I could spin, I could flip upside down, I could fly like Superman, I could be fast, I could be slow. It was really, really cool. The second best thing would have to be looking out the windows at the views of Earth. What was your least favorite thing on the space station? Oh man, cleaning the toilet and vacuuming on Saturdays. We Every Saturday we had to do work just like I was home. And I had to get out the vacuum cleaner, I had to take out wet wipes, and I had to wipe everything down. That was a pain in the rear end. 
Awesome. Well, thank you so much for talking with us today. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Here at Stim and 30, we have our very own game show. Let's go over to Beth with Stim It to win it. Thanks, Marty. I'm here with some friends from uh, Potomac Prep. Now, the name of the game is Then or Now. I'm going to read you a question about the International Space Station, and you hit the buzzer, and you tell me whether it's happening now or if it happened 15 years ago. Are you all ready to begin? Yes. Yeah. Okay. The first statement is, astronauts are able to tweet from space. Now. Now. Okay, let's see what the in-house audience says. Uh, it's a, it's, most of them say now. There are a few thens out there. Our online audience says now. Let's hear from Kathy and Marty. Were astronauts tweeting from space 15 years ago? No, this audience is making me feel old. <laughs> there was no Twitter back then 15 years ago. So now is the right answer. Awesome. All right, Beth, you got another question? Yes, our next statement is the size of the crew on the International Space Station is three. Then or now? Then. Then? Let's see what our in-house audience says. Uh, again, our in-house audience is really divided. The online audience says then. Let's see. Uh, let's hear from Kathy and Marty. Crew on the space station size of three. Is that then or now? That was then. Now we have six. So we've got a, a much larger crew now. All right, Beth, you got another question? Yes, I do. Okay. Are you ready? Astronauts recycle urine and sweat into drinking water. Then or now? Now. Now? Okay, uh, let's, uh, uh, let's, let's see what our in-house audience is. Okay, it looks like a lot of them are saying now, and the online audience says now. Let's hear what uh, Kathy and Marty have to say. Astronauts recycling water on the space station. Was that then or is that now? That is now. In fact, Scott Kelly is going to drink 730 gallons of recycled urine during the course of his stay on the ISS. Wow, that's incredibly gross, but that's really cool as well. <laughs> All right, Beth, do you have another one? We do. Our last question is, are you ready? Yes. Astronauts love taking pictures from space then or now. No. Now? And okay. You Let's see now what our in-house audience is. Looks like then and now from the in-house audience. Our online audience says now. Let's see what Kathy and Marty have to say. Taking pictures and looking at Earth from space, then or now? Trick question. Then and now. That was the first thing astronauts did when they first orbit the Earth. And 1961, and they still love it to, to this day. Well, and it's really cool now that, that astronauts are able to tweet from space, they can share those images almost real time with us from outer space. Yes, we can see what they're doing and when they're, hap when they're doing it. That's really cool. All right, are you ready for some questions? Yes. Great. All right, we've got another Sophia from uh, Rutland, Vermont, that's got a question for us. How does underwater training help astronauts in space? How does underwater training help the astronauts? Well, the Problem is that in outer space you don't have gravity, you don't have an environment, and underwater training is the one way we can simulate near as close as possible to what it's like out in space to spacewalk. So the astronauts suit up in a space suit, that's weighted down, they have scuba men guiding them along, so it gives them a feeling for the physics of working out in space. It's not an exact match, but it's as close as we can do awesome. here on Earth. All right, we've got an audience question next. Hi, I'm Vashtar. My question is, are animals, are there animals in the space station? Are there animals on the space station? They take some animals for very, very limited experiments on the space station, but they haven't had large animals. We think of dogs in space or monkeys, but they've never gone up with humans. But what the kind of animals they take, they take insects, to, and they've taken... Um, uh, spiders to see how they function in space and how they move around. But they're very limited and they have to be isolated because you don't want animals to escape in your space station. I, it's going to be a pretty big mess. I would not want spiders running around the space station no, I wouldn't. at all. <laughs> all right, we've got an online question next. How long will the International Space Station stay in operation? Well, that's a very good question because it's a, it's a matter of diplomacy and funding. The space station is supposed to stay in operation until 2025. 20, um, the United States and NASA has been 
talking about getting it to stay until 2027. They have to wait to see if the Russians agree. Um, and they also have to wait to see what the next plans are. If they're going to do a joint mission to Mars, they may, they may cut it short, or they may use the space station as a jumping off point for a Mars mission. Great. All right, we've got another online question. What is microgravity? Well, as I was saying before, falling was missing in the word cloud. And that's what microgravity is. It's that, that falling at 17 and a half thousand miles an hour, never quite falling back to Earth, but still having that feeling of falling. Astronauts don't really feel it when they're inside the space station because the, the whole station is falling. When they really feel it is when they go out to take a spacewalk. And they look out and they actually feel that sensation of falling. And sometimes they say it takes them a little while to let go of that handle because they, you know, they're, they're <laughs> strapped on, but they, they feel that falling sensation. And they're actually falling at the same rate as the space station. They're falling at the same rate as the space station. They're just not aware of it awesome. until they're out there. All right, we've got an audience question. My name is Destiny, and my question is how long did it take to build the International Space Station? How long did it take to build the International Space Station? Well, that is another trick question because they're still building it. They started out with the three units uh, in 2000. The first one was launched in 1998, and they finally bolted them together and inhabited it in 2000. But they're still adding components, and there are three components that are waiting to be launched to be bolted onto the space station. So they're still building it 15 years later. Awesome. Well, Kathy, thank you so much for joining us today. I'd like to thank all of our online viewers for watching today and submitting some really good questions. We want to encourage you guys to watch our next show, December 17th, as we come to you from Dearborn, Michigan. We're on the 112th anniversary of the Wright Brothers' first flight. Here's Beth with more information. Hi, I'm Beth Wilson, one of the hosts of STEM in 30. Take a look at this. This is Orville Wright's mandolin. Hey, he was an inventor, not in a band. Yes, okay, Orville and his brother did invent the airplane, but a lot of scientists and engineers and inventors have other interests in painting, drawing, music, and dance. But according to Orville's sister, Catherine, <sighs> Orville has begun lessons on the mandolin. <laughs> and we are getting even with the neighborhood for the noise they have made on pianos. He sits around and picks that thing until I can hardly stay in the house. Well, he may have not been the best mandolin player, but at least he gave it a try. If you think this is interesting, be sure to check out our next STEM 30. We hope to see everybody next month when we come to you from Dearborn, Michigan. Thanks for watching. I can't imagine anything scarier than weightless spiders flying around.